Hi, my name's Ben Carter, and I wanted to do a brief video to talk about a little project I've been working on for a while now as an exercise in learning Verilog and FPGA design. So what we have here is an unmodified Super Nintendo, well, aside from the lid having been taken off. And if we switch it on, we get this. The scene you see here is entirely ray traced in real time on the snares. Well, technically not completely on the snares. One of the most interesting things from that era of gaming was that many titles made use of expansion chips in the game cartridge that provided extra functionality, the most famous probably being the Super FX chip used for 3D graphics in Star Fox and several other games. So what I decided would be an interesting project, for certain values of interesting, was to design my own expansion chip, which I've been calling Super RT, that adds support for ray tracing to the snares. And that's the rat's nest of wiring you can see here. I picked up a copy of an absolutely terrible pachinko game, removed the game ROM from the cartridge, and then connected an FPGA, or Field Programmable Gate Array, in its place. As you can probably tell from looking at it, hardware is not really my forte, but it does at least work. So if I grab the joypad, we can move around the scene a little and look at some of the things the chip can do. As you can see, uh, we have ray trace shadows and reflections, uh, moving objects, and if we move over to the right here, you'll see that we can even replicate some real-world optical effects, such as the inverted reflection in this concave mirror. SuperRT defines objects as collections of primitives, spheres and planes primarily, which can be put together to form arbitrary shapes. It also supports a form of CSG, constructive solid geometry, allowing objects to be combined with or subtracted from each other. This pillar is an example, with the bubbles rising up being spheres that are subtracted from the main body. The lake, earlier on, was also built this way, by cutting holes into the floor. It's possible to create some quite interesting and complex shapes this way. Being a ray tracer, none of the reflections or shadowing in this scene are pre-computed, so we can move the sun around like this, and everything updates in real time. Frame rate wise, this scene runs at around 20 frames a second. 30 FPS is the practical maximum due to the fact that the SNES doesn't have enough bandwidth to DMA the screen contents any faster than that. In case you're wondering, I've tried with this implementation to stick to the spirit of what could practically have been done with a SNES expansion chip. So this isn't a case where there's a PC or an ARM SOC running everything behind the scenes. The SNES is firmly in the driving seat here, with the SuperRT only handling ray tracing duties, image data conversion, and providing some extra maths functions. To take a little bit more of an in-depth look at the chip, as mentioned before, it's a pure ray tracer, and it handles a few basic primitive types, spheres and planes mainly, with convex hulls being constructed from sets of planes. Axis-aligned bounding boxes are technically renderable, but are mainly used for culling volumes. Architecturally, the bulk of the work is done by three homogeneous execution cores, each running at 50 MHz. I'll talk a bit more in detail about those shortly. The image resolution is 200 by 160 That was mainly picked because it's about the sweet spot in terms of balancing how much time the SNES has for image data DMA versus the actual size of the image data that needs to be transferred. The chip works internally in 24-bit colour, which is then converted down to 256 colours for transfer to the snares. The relatively small palette size is a bit of an issue in terms of image quality, sadly. Smooth shadings are not, does not always come across very well, even with a bit of dithering added. The Ray engine handles single bounce reflections and shadowing from a single directional light source, so each screen pixel has to trace up to four separate rays. Object construction uses a span-based CSG system in ray space, and for speed, bounding volume hierarchies are used to cull chunks of the scene which do not intersect the ray being processed. And finally, as previously mentioned, the whole thing is implemented as an expansion chip sat on the SNES cartridge bus. The hardware for this is actually pretty simple. We have a completely stock SNES, which is connected via the cartridge bus to a D10 Nano FPGA dev board, with a Cyclone 5 FPGA, which is loaded with the design. 
technically the D10 board does actually have an ARM core available too, but as previously mentioned, to try and stick with the broad spirit of mid-90s technology, that's completely unused here. Now, you may all be looking at this and thinking, hey, isn't there a flaw in this plan? Because, yes, there is a flaw. The SNES runs at 5 volts, whilst the D10 runs at 3.3 volts. This is actually the main reason for the massive pile of breadboards and wires you can see here. In between the two, we have to have some level shifter chips to convert the voltages used and keep both sides happy. Moving on to the architecture of the chip, there are a number of core modules involved. First and most important is the render module. This is responsible for calculating ray directions and generally managing the process of rendering a scene. Connected to it, we have the ray engine, which manages the life cycle of a single screen ray, tracing the primary secondary rays as required and figuring out what the final pixel color should be. To do that, it uses an execution engine, which is essentially a very specialized CISC processor that executes a sequence of instructions describing the scene and calculates ray intersections with it. To improve performance, there are actually three of these ray and execution engine pairs. Next up, we have the PPU converter. This takes the rendered images and turns them into a format that the SNES can display, converting them down to 256 colors and swizzling the data into bit planes. The PPU converter has a number of RAM banks that it uses for this process. Normally, SNES expansion chips are accompanied with an external game ROM, but for development purposes, SuperRT implements a small ROM as part of the chip itself, giving space for 32 kilobytes of SNES program code. This could be made bigger, except at present my interface hardware only connects the SNES address bus A, limiting the available address space to just 64k, of which about half is needed for communication between the SNES and SuperRT itself. There's also a small bit of ancillary hardware for the SNES to use here in the form of a multiplication unit that lets the SNES perform fast 16-bit by 16-bit multiplies. All of this is then tied together by the SNES interface module, which handles communication between the various parts of the chip and the SNES. And finally, there's an optional module for debugging, which connects to a second monitor using the HDMI port on the D10 board and allows the internal state of the chip to be displayed there. You may have noticed earlier that I actually have a Mega Drive pad on the desk as well. That's used to control the debug interface, as connecting a Mega Drive pad to the D10 board was much easier than connecting a SNES pad. The execution units are very much the heart of the system, each being effectively a small processor. They have 4K of dedicated RAM, which holds the current scene program, stored as 64-bit instructions. Each instruction represents a single primitive element or, or a control operation. Execution of those instructions is performed using a number of pipelines. The main instruction pipeline is responsible for everything which isn't a primitive intersection managing instruction fetch, flow control, and various other tasks. Pipelines are all 14 cycles deep and retire one instruction per cycle, with the exception of branches, which can take up to 16 cycles due to needing to flush the pipeline. Since that's very slow, there's a branch prediction system to try and avoid those pipeline flushes wherever possible. Incidentally, internally maths is done using 32-bit integer values in 1814 fixed point format with 16-bit values used for direction vectors or other quantities that are known to never go outside the plus minus one range. There are two other pipelines. One handles intersection with axis-aligned bounding boxes, whilst the other is a combined pipeline that handles spheres and planes. This uses two maths units that perform fast reciprocal and square root operations. And that's basically it for now. I'd love to hear any thoughts you might have on this, and if anyone is interested, I'm planning to post more details and discussion of some of the interesting things that I've encountered whilst designing this onto my website in the not-too-distant future. Thank you for watching.